Now, the examples we have here are obviously not moon rocks. They're, they're Earth equivalents selected to be quite similar to those on the moon, and they really are extremely similar. This is a thin section of a moon rock. The long crystals are plagioclase, and between them are the pyroxene crystals, both minerals that we know from the Earth. This is a thin section of an Earth equivalent, very similar in appearance. And this is a lunar breccia, and this is a thin section of the onoping breccia, an Earth breccia. So those rocks are really extremely similar to Earth equivalents, or the moon rocks are extremely similar to Earth equivalents. And we can interpret them by understanding the processes which we know to have created the Earth equivalents. Let's take, for example, first the anorthosite, this very light-colored igneous rock formed almost solely of light-colored feldspar crystals. Well, we know that anorthosite results from fractional crystallization, a process that we discussed when we looked at igneous rocks, where within a large body of molten material, early crystals, which are heavy, sink to the bottom to form a distinctive kind of igneous rock. And if there were light crystals, they would float to the top. Now, we know that anorthosite is formed by a concentration of lightweight and light-colored feldspar crystals in the upper part of a body of molten rock, such as this in the, in the diagram. So we know that anorthosite results from fractional crystallization of a large body of molten rock. Where do we find anorthosite? What sort of body of molten rock did the anorthosite result from? Well, we find anorthosite in the highland areas of the moon, the light-colored and highly cratered areas of the moon. That's where the anorthosite is found. There's supplementary evidence for the occurrence of anorthosite from the satellite observations, or from the observations made from the command module on the Apollo flights, of the uh, X-rays remitted from the rocks of the lunar surface after they've been bombarded by X-rays which impact on them from the sun. The elements, silicon and aluminum, emit characteristic X-rays when they're bombarded by those from the sun, which we can read in instruments circulating around the, the moon. And from this fact, we know that the highland areas show a great richness in aluminum as compared with silicon. And this is typical of anorthosite. The feldspar, the plagioclase feldspar that makes up the anorthosite is rich in aluminum. So we've got that kind of secondary evidence rather than this direct evidence of the fact that the lunar highlands are formed of anorthosite. We've also got some other evidence, and that is from seismic work. Seismic uh, experiments conducted on the surface of the moon after the astronauts have left. The charges that they leave are detonated, and then the path of the waves are plotted. Those experiments have revealed that there seems to be a shell of about 50 or 60 kilometers thick of anorthosite, or at least the speed of the seismic waves is the same as it would be if that rock were anorthosite. So there are good grounds for believing that it is anorthosite. So the evidence points to there being a continuous shell, a spherical shell of anorthosite, about 60 kilometers thick, forming the upper crust of the moon, and covered in some areas by the gray material that we'll look at in a moment that forms the so-called lunar Seas. Now, in what sort of circumstances can we get a 60 kilometer thick continuous shell of anorthosite that's produced by the fractional crystallization of molten rock? Well, remembering that that anorthosite cannot have been revealed by erosion because there isn't much erosion on the surface of the moon, we must look for a continuous layer of molten rock on the surface of the moon a continuous layer, perhaps 200 kilometers 
thick, a veritable hellish ocean of white-hot molten rock from which the anorthosite here in orange resulted by the accumulation of the light crystals and the heavier crystals forming another layer and the lower part of the molten material. Here we've only got a remnant, a thin remnant of the molten material left. Now, why did that occur? What sort of time did it occur? Well, first of all, the time, the age of the anorthosite. The age of the anorthosite, which was collected by the Apollo 15 astronauts, and the age of fragments of anorthosite, which had been found in the lunar breccias, is over 4 billion years, something in the order of 4.1, 4.2, even up to 4.4 billion years in age. This is very, very much older well over a billion years older than anything that we find on the Earth. Our oldest uh, rocks on Earth are something over three billion years. And it seems then that the Moon, in its very early stages, was covered by a continuous sea of molten rock, and that was about four billion years ago. The origin, the cause of that molten rock, well, it's thought that probably the heat for the generation of the molten material was produced by the continuous impact of meteorites. And the energy of those impacts was converted into heat, which melted the surface layer. So those are the first two stages, then, of lunar history that we can trace through understanding the processes through which anorthosite results, the generation of a molten layer and the fractional crystallization of a 60 kilometer thick anorthosite crust. How about the norite? That's the second of the rocks that we shall look at. Well, norite is produced by a different kind of process in uh, a different kind of igneous process, another one that we've met earlier. We met that kind of process, partial melting, in this kind of situation, where a subducting plate of ocean material became very hot as it descended into the asthenosphere of the Earth, and part of that plate melted to give rise to volcanoes, the volcanoes of island arcs. That's the process of partial melting. We also found it beneath spreading ridges, where molten material is generated that comes up the mid-ocean ridges as the two plates of an ocean spread apart. Now, forget the geological situation, which is applicable only to the Earth, where we have lithospheric plates. Just remember the process. Partial melting, the melting of solid material to give a molten lava, but only the melting of part of that solid material. And it's thought that the norite might be the product of the partial melting, the melting of part of that anorthosite uh, crust, which originated about four billion years ago on the moon. But what sort of evidence have we got for the distribution of the norite? Where did it partially melt? In what sort of geological or lunar geological situation did it, did it melt? Well, the evidence for the distribution of the norite suggests that it occurs in isolated peaks, light colored, in the dark areas of the moon. For example, here in Oceanus Procellarum, and also in Mare Imbrium. The way that we're able to detect the, the uh, distribution of the norite is from the fact that the norite is very rich in uranium and in thorium and in certain other elements which emit characteristic radiation that, once again, we're able to plot in the orbiting command module of the Apollo flights. And that's what gives the uh, indication of where the norite is distributed.